Hello, everyone. Good morning. I'm Sarah Dunham, the Director of the Office of Transportation and Air Quality here at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And I am extremely excited to welcome you all here today. It's an honor for me to be here today because in just a few minutes, Administrator Regan will be signing the agency's final rule to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from passenger cars and light duty trucks. Today's announcement is the result of a lot of hard work from the dedicated EPA staff. I've been at the agency for almost 24 years and it has been a privilege for me every day to work side by side with the career professionals at the agency who bring passion, commitment to the agency's mission, and integrity to their work. With the time I have today, there is no way I can thank everyone who contributed to this rule. This team at EPA did the technical analysis, issued a proposal, reviewed thousands of public comments, and completed a final action in less than a year. This is an extraordinary accomplishment. And I want to thank in particular Robin Moran, Mike Olichu, David Orlin, Mark Kataoka, Beth Miller, Tad Weiser, and Todd Sherwood, who worked with colleagues across the agency under the amazing leadership of Bill Charmley. The rule being announced today is a perfect example of agency professionalism in carrying out its mission. At EPA, we follow the science, and we follow the law, and that is what has led us to this moment. We never forget that our job is to protect public health and the environment. And we also understand how critical it is to listen to and engage with all of our stakeholders. This final rule has been significantly shaped by input from the public, including input from vehicle manufacturers, part suppliers, communities experiencing impacts from climate change, and environmental organizations who have provided important technical analysis to build the strong foundation of this rule. And we have learned from colleagues across the federal government, as well as representatives from state and local governments. We also know that it is very important to look to the future as we are designing the rules that are before us. And we are surrounded today by a glimpse of what is possible. President Biden and Administrator Regan have laid out a powerful long-term vision for putting the transportation sector on a path toward zero emissions. And leaders in the auto industry are making investments right now to achieve that future. We believe this rule announced today reflects that long-term vision creates the foundation and support needed to achieve that mission. Thank you again to my colleagues in the Office of Air and Radiation and across the agency, and to Administrator Regan for leading us to this achievement. It is now my pleasure to introduce Inse Odboot Witherspoon, Executive Director of the Children's Environmental Health Network. Good morning, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you and to mark this important rule that will certainly benefit all of us, our children of today and for generations to come, including our most vulnerable and marginalized communities. I'm here wearing a few hats today. One hat is a public health leader and a child health advocate with the Children's Environmental Health Network, where our mission has been the same for close to 30 years, to advocate for equitable pr protection of all children, infants, and and pregnant moms from environmental hazards and promoting all of their collective safety, protection, and well-being. We also care very much about women of childbearing age since we know that research abundantly shows that children are impacted by what they're exposed to in their first environment, which is their mom's womb. Another hat that I'm wearing today is as a mom. My husband and I are proud parents to four amazing children, in our humble opinion. Uh, our oldest uh, son, Ajani, is right here joining me today. He's an engineering major at North Carolina A&T. And we talk, and we talk often about he and how his friends and his generation care very much about the climate that they are inheriting and living in, sustainability challenges, and what the future actually holds for them. We talk about these realities often at home and among our community and the need for robust and equitable solutions. This is also very personal for us. Our youngest son, 11-year-old Ayan, has suffered from asthma most of his life. I've been the mother taking her first ride in an ambulance with him when his oxygen levels were so poor that the pediatrician would not allow me to drive him himself. We as parents work hard to ensure that our children get all that they want and, and that they thrive to their fullest potential. But when you see your child struggling to breathe, take their next breath, we all become helpless, unable to provide them the security that they deserve. That is a position that no parent or grandparent asked to or should be in. 
We know that asthma is still the number one chronic illness among children. It is also the leading cause of absenteeism, you know, minus the COVID pandemic these days. If you cannot be healthy enough to be in school to learn, that creates another ripple effect related to a child's educational journey, their ability to focus and remain engaged. Childhood asthma is also a key environmental justice issue and has been, as African-American and Latinx children witness higher incidence rates of asthma. Undisputed peer-reviewed literature has shown us that there is significant association between neighborhood traffic and asthma and upper respiratory-like issues among our children. For example, groundbreaking research out of Columbia University's Children's Environmental Health Center years ago provided evidence that children that live within a 500 feet proximity from a major thoroughfare can actually experience onset of asthma. So not just severity, but onset of this chronic illness. In addition to health benefits, there are also cost benefits to reducing vehicle air pollution. According to the CDC just this year, the asthma estimated cost to the U.S. economy has been more than 80 billion annually in medical expenses, days missed from work, childcare, school, and unfortunately deaths. Today is a win for all asthmatics, their parents, grandparents, caregivers, teachers, healthcare professionals, employers, and coaches. Today is also a win for childhood cancer prevention. The Children's Environmental Health Network is a leader in the Cancer-Free Economy Network, a multidisciplinary effort to change the paradigm of how we address cancer to include medical advancement in treatments options while also acknowledging and pursuing preventive aspects of this field. We need both. Through this work, we also helped to launch the Childhood Cancer Prevention Initiative with partners like the American Sustainable Business Network, child ca cancer prevention organizations like Prep for Gold, faith-based organizations like Green the Church, and public health research organizations like University of Massachusetts at Lowell. Together, we released a groundbreaking report, Childhood Cancer Prevention, Cross-Sector Strategies for Prevention, where addition, addition, in addition to pesticides, paints, and solvents, vehicle air pollution is indicated as a clear as an important growing exposure pathway, excuse me. Childhood cancer incidence has been rising annually since 1975. The most stringent vehicle emissions that this rule will set will assist in reducing respiratory illness such as asthma, as well as reducing the likelihood of childhood cancer risks and assist with our climate and health solutions. It's a win-win across the board. Because we know even short-term effects to PM 2.5 have negative implications on lung function, the reduction of PM 2.5 through this rule will show positive returns for our most vulnerable populations, including pregnant women, children, and our elderly. Fence line community members, low wealth, and other marginalized communities that continue to be exposed to traffic-related pollution and additional exposures of concern stand to benefit greatly by this new rule. Thank you, Administrator Regan. Thank you for all of our wonderful uh, EPA staff who have worked diligently for at least a good six months or so to produce this rule and to make this greenhouse gas rules for passenger and lightweight vehicles a true reality. The Children's Environmental Health Network looks forward to continuing to work with you to help move forward placing the needs of our vulnerable children and all vulnerable populations first. Thank you very much, and I'd now like to introduce Elizabeth Brandt, Field Manager for Moms Clean Air Force, a wonderful partner for the Children's Environmental Health Network, and her daughter, Valencia. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Brandt, mom to Valencia and Natalia, and a field manager with Moms Clean Air Force. Moms Clean Air Force is an organization of more than one million moms, dads, aunties, and grandparents across America, taking action on climate change and clean air for the sake of our kids' health. I'm thrilled to be at the EPA today with my daughter to celebrate the release of this new rule on tailpipe emissions from cars and light duty trucks. Today, we mark a major step forward in protecting our families from air pollution and climate change. I live with my family in nearby Montgomery County, Maryland. We live very close to a busy highway and a thoroughfare that leads to an interstate. We breathe tailpipe pollution every day, standing at the bus stop, visiting our neighbors, and walking to school. Reducing tailpipe pollution is much needed in my neighborhood and in Maryland at large. According to the latest State of the Air report from the American Lung Association, six Maryland counties receive failing grades for ozone pollution. 
Only one Maryland county got an A, and sadly, that's not our county. This story is not unique. Lots of America is flunking the clean air test or earning an underachieving C like my county. Across the country, more than 40% of Americans, over 135 million people, are living in places where the air is unhealthy to breathe. And this burden is not shared equally. People of color are three times more likely to be breathing unhealthy air. Our children deserve better than this. Children like Columba, age six, who lives in Phoenix, near heavy traffic pollution. Poor air quality has landed little Columba in the hospital more than once. Oscar, age 10, lives near Detroit, Michigan, where his moderate asthma is often triggered by poor air quality. Children like Joey, age 11, who lives in Nevada, after suffering from COVID, his allergenic asthma became severe asthma, and now he regularly struggles to breathe. Pollution from the nearby highway makes this worse. Isaiah is here. He's from DC. He's an athlete whose coaches have to monitor the air quality daily and sometimes have to cancel practice due to the poor air quality in the district here. And then there's my dear friend, Dane, in Seattle. I first met Dane when he was a newborn in the NICU. Dane was born with a genetic condition that makes his health very fragile. Dane has been hospitalized for breathing difficulty more times than I can count. Dane is unable to go outside at all on high pollution days. This rule is arriving just in time for Dane's ninth birthday. I believe that the EPA is giving Dane the very best gift of all. Reducing tailpipe pollution is also good for our climate. Climate change is harming our children, our families, and our communities. From floods to tornadoes, from crushing heat to wildfires, climate change is an urgent health crisis. We need to reduce the pollution causing climate change. And cars make up a big part of that pollution. Over the past few months, our members have submitted comments and testified in support of the strongest possible tailpipe pollution standards. Together with dozens of partner organizations, our members flooded the docket, submitting more than 200,000 comments urging EPA to finalize ambitious pollution standards for cars. Today, I am so glad to say that the EPA listened to moms. That's good news for Columba. It's good news for Oscar, Joey, Isaiah, Dane, and my own children, like Valencia, and all children who breathe. It's good news for all the kids whose asthma is made worse by car pollution. For every parent who wants a healthy and stable future for their children. We have a lot more work to do to clean up pollution from cars. But today, we are celebrating a much needed step forward, which has taken into account the input of stakeholders like us. Thank you, Administrator Regan. Keep going. We need you to work on the next model years and to continue the work of cleaning up the air and climate pollution from the transportation sector for the sake of our children's health. This holiday and every day, we know there is no greater gift for our children than clean air and a stable climate. And with that, I would like to hand over the podium to Valencia, my daughter, who is a Rock Creek Forest elementary student. Let's pull over your stool. Hi, my name is Valencia Benar and I am eight years old. I am from Seattle, Washington originally, but I went across United States to live in Maryland. I am joining you today because it is important to me to have a healthy climate and less pollution from cars. Thank you, President Biden, EPA Administrator Regan, and all the people at EPA and across our country who have asked EPA to make cars pollute less. Climate change is a problem for kids like me. I play street hockey and in the summer it can be really hot. You can't play as well when it's too hot. 
The summer didn't used to be as hot as it is now. We have really strong rainstorms, and scientists say climate change makes rainstorms worse. Last summer, rainstorms happened for seven days in a row. When it rains like that, the pool closes and we can't play outside. I also like the snow, and I don't want climate change to take away snow days. We live close to busy roads, and car pollution isn't good for us. Kids are trying to do our part. We walk and ride our bikes to get around, but the cars make it harder. Cars create a lot of pollution are a big part of the climate change problem. We ask the EPA to help cars pollute less. Thank you for listening to us. I think this rule can solve a problem. Across America, a lot of teens like me are exposed to more particle pollution than most Americans. That can cause more health problems. I learned that people of color and people with less money live with more pollution overall. These differences are important to fix so that all people can be healthy. Cleaning up car pollution is one thing we can do, but we need to keep fighting for clean air and a healthy climate. And now I'd like to introduce EPA Administrator Michael Regan. Thank you for listening to us, Administrator Regan. Good morning. Thank you, Valencia. I tell you, Valencia is a tough act to follow. I'll have to talk to my staff about that afterwards. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Uh, this, this is an exciting day for the EPA team. Uh, this day is truly, is truly historic. When President Biden took office, he committed to tackling the climate crisis with a sense of urgency, determination, and ingenuity that this crisis demands. The President tasked EPA specifically with setting forward-leaning standards that reduce greenhouse gas pollution, drive technological innovation, all while creating good-paying good paying jobs. Well, I'm proud to say that we are delivering on our commitment to the President of the United States. We're delivering on our commitment to the American people. We're delivering on our commitment to Valencia by setting the most ambitious vehicle pollution standards for greenhouse gases ever established for passenger cars and light duty trucks. I've said it time and time again. At EPA, we follow the science and we follow the law. And the science is calling for urgent action to reduce pollution, fueling climate change, and making people sick. That's why today we're setting robust and rigorous standards that will aggressively reduce pollution, protect people's health, and save families money at the same time. In model year 2026, these standards will be the most ambitious standards in United States history. These standards, which are underpinned by the world-class technical expertise of EPA career staff and grounded in science, show that the standards are achievable, affordable, and will deliver significant pollution reduction. We estimate that through the year 2050, uh, this program will save American drivers up to $420 billion on fuel cost, gas that you won't have to put in the tank. Avoid more than 3 billion tons of greenhouse gas pollution, which is equal to more than half the U.S. total carbon emissions in the year 2019 and provide Americans with as much as $190 billion in net benefits from reduced climate impacts and improved public health. This rule is a decisive step in setting the United States on a course towards a zero emission future and reestablishing the United States auto industry as the global leader in clean vehicle technology. I'm proud, I'm very proud to work in concert with leading automakers who are moving the ball forward on climate action by putting regulations in place that advance the innovation and the ambition that they're demonstrating. EPA's analysis shows that car manufacturers can comply with these standards, increasing the number of electric vehicles entering the fleet and with technologies available right now, available today. We also project the sales of electric and plug-in hybrids will grow from about 7% market share 
in the year model year 2023 to about 17 percent in model year 2026. Over the past several months, nearly all major automakers have announced plans to transition their vehicle fleets to zero emissions, with many new electric vehicles launched before 2026. I've had the opportunity to test drive some of these firsthand, and boy, they are fun to drive. I'm really excited that we have a few here today, although it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to test drive any of them. But the entry of so many new EV models over the next few years will put the auto industry in a strong position to meet our historic standards. When I took this role, I asked my team to go further and faster than they've ever gone before to confront the climate crisis. Because I believe that we have a responsibility to Valencia, to my son Matthew, to the next generation. We have a responsibility to communities who are most heavily impacted by climate change. And I'm deeply proud of the team who's worked tirelessly, not only on today's car rule, but on all of EPA's historic climate actions over the past 10 months, from setting a framework to phase down and to phase down the production and consumption of super pollutant HFCs, to crafting an ambitious proposal to slash methane, one of the biggest drivers of climate change. These actions are more than setting standards and targets. In my time as administrator, I've met with frontline communities who are sick and tired of watching the floodwaters rise and the sewage seep into their basements. I've spent time with farmers whose livelihoods have been severely impacted by pro prolonged periods of drought. I've spoken with young people who are deeply worried about the world that they will inherit and who are begging us to act while we still have time. Nelson Mandela said, each of us as citizens has a role to play in creating a better world for all of our children. That's especially true for those of us in positions of power and influence. That's why these actions matter. Because what we're really talking about is protecting the people we love, creating a healthier future for all of our children, and fundamentally changing people's lives for the better. That's our number one objective today and every day. And that's what we're doing with this final rule. So thank you all for the partnership. Thank you all for the steadfast leadership. And thank you all for being here today. And with that, I'll take a few questions from the press. Hi, Anna Phillips with the Washington Post. Um, I was hoping you could address Build Back Better and how without the tax credits and incentives in that bill, will you still be able to achieve the 17% EV uh, market penetration by 2026? Yes, we're gonna move forward very aggressively. Um, and we're gonna continue to do what EPA has been doing over the past 10 months, which is move forward with our statutory authority based on technical an analysis and data and, and cost effectiveness. Uh, we're going to follow the president's lead. Uh, he's done a wonderful job delivering for the American people with the American Rescue Plan. Uh, he's done a wonderful job delivering for the American people with the bipartisan infrastructure deal. And I believe that he will do a great job in pursuing the equities uh, in terms of tax credits, clean energy opportunities within Build Back Better that will help continue to push this rule uh, even further. So we're excited about the opportunities. We're excited about this proposed rulemaking, and we're excited about the, the Build Back Better potential. Hi, it's uh, Tim Pucco at the Wall Street Journal. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, if I could just follow up on the last question. Um, so if, if the Build Back Better Act doesn't go through, and things are looking not that well right now, um, could you just explain how automakers will comply? They've been pretty adamant that their support was conditional on uh, the the, um, uh, the efforts to help them coming through in, in the congressional package? You know, when we look at the technical analysis we've done, the conversations with the automakers, what we're proposing today, we believe is historic and we believe uh, is capable. Uh, that's not to say that we're not going to continue to fight tirelessly uh, for those incentives that are uh, in the Build Back Better proposal. Uh, but nevertheless, we believe that we've proposed a rule that is doable. It's affordable, it's achievable, and we're excited about it. 
Uh, Administrator Dave Shepardson from Reuters uh, over here. Two, oh. two questions. One, can you tell us what changed between August and today in terms of the final rule? Obviously, this rule is more stringent than the initial proposal. And, and can you talk about the next set of standards you plan to issue, when we might see those, what, what time period they might cover? And are you concerned between now and when the automakers ramp up EV sales that they will have some trouble meeting the early years, given that, at least on the NHTSA side, they face some, some, some of the automakers face some significant CAFE penalties in the next couple years? Yes, we'll, we'll continue to work with the automakers, and we'll continue to work with uh, Ray Curry and the UAW. Um, you know, in terms of what has changed, if you look at the proposal, uh, the years 2023 and 2024 largely stay the same. That lead time is still there. Uh, the aggressive posture really begins in model year 25 and 2026. Again, historic uh, levels at 2026. Um, this final proposal, uh, you know, it, it doubles the amount of, of greenhouse gas uh, pollution that we're going to reduce by 2050. Over 3 billion tons of CO2 reduced uh, by 2050. Uh, listen, we're excited. We spent time during the comment period listening to all of our stakeholders. Uh, we spent time combing through the data, uh, really having our staff uh, apply that technical rigor that EPA is so well known for. And we are looking forward to, to moving forward. This is, as you say, uh, just the first bite at the apple. Uh, we're excited about what we've proposed for 2023, 24, 25, and 26. Um, but listen, a after I end this one, we'll go back and, and get back to work looking at 2027 and beyond. Uh, we believe that this is a moment in time. Uh, the science speaks to that. And I believe that EPA, uh, the communities, the auto manufacturers, the UAW, we're all poised to take advantage of this moment. All right. Thank you all. And now we'll, we'll sign this bill. Thank you all. This is a big day for EPA. This is a big day for our children. This is a big day for the auto manufacturers and jobs as well. Thank you all. Thank you. Oh, no, no, all of us. It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> Long time coming. It's an honor to be here.
Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a nice holiday. You too. Happy holiday.